The title of my message is God, Man, and Land. So you probably hear this for the first time. God, Man, and Land. So before we look at this unique relationship between God and, ma- and the man and land, we need to first look at who God is, and then we need to know what God intended for the man as well as the land that we live in. When we read Genesis chapter 1, we get to know that God, who we worship, is the God who is the creator of this universe. Now, the word Genesis in the Greek means birth or origin at which something comes into being. And so rightly said, Genesis is a book filled with beginnings. It's all about beginnings. And so the word Genesis reflects the meaning of beginnings or origins. In Genesis 1, 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm so glad that the Bible said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it didn't say, once upon a time, God created uh, the heavens and the earth. That would be a fairy tale. That's how stories start, uh, are told, once upon a time. But here the Bible begins with, in the very beginning. Before time, before space, before the existence of this universe, God existed, revealing to us that God is bigger than this universe, bigger than what we could even think or even imagine. And then from verses 2 to 4, Genesis describes the condition of this world or the condition of the earth. It's, it says, the Bible was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit starts right there in the, in the book of Genesis, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the whole concept of day and night existed or came into existence when God spoke, let there be light. From verses 4 to 26, God created the the plant as well as the animal kingdom. I'm saving time and not reading those verses, but that's what God did. You see it in Genesis 4 to 26. Then God created the man with his own hands to be a far more superior being than all that he created and gave him dominion over the earth. Tell someone next to you, you are very special to God. We were uniquely designed. When God created this world, he spoke and it it came to pass. But for you and me, he made us with his own hands. He put his own breath on the inside of us. We read that in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our character, in our likeness. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I have this in my imagination. It looks like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit got together and said, let us make. Who's the us? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They said, let us make man not like what we have created before. We will create a unique species on the earth, and we will call him the man. And when we make him that man, by putting our breath in him, God said, let them rule and have dominion. We will back off and we will let man have dominion over everything we have created. You know, you create a little playhouse and tell your child, see what I did? I got you a beautiful playhouse and you play. How big is the playhouse? Two by two probably, a little bigger than that. God created a world 
for you and me to enjoy. He says, go have fun. Look at the creation. You have dominion. Dominion over the fish, dominion over the birds, dominion over the cattle, dominion over every creeping thing. And we must be careful. We must not elevate animal life above human life. Can somebody shout an amen? You abuse one another, it's okay. You abuse my dog, I'll hit you. People have more value on their dog than on a human being. What dog's life that is? You know, and today we are caught in that trap. Animals are, if you kill an animal, you are sentenced for five years or ten years or probably life in prison. You abuse another woman, it's only for five years. Animal life has taken a priority above human life. But that's not what God did in the beginning. He says, man have dominion over the planet, plant kingdom as well as the animal kingdom. The only thing that God says you don't have dominion over is one another. Smile at me. We are excellent at having dominion over one another. Except what God told us to have dominion over. God handed over the responsibility to man in order to run this universe. Or rather this world. In verse 27, so God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them or created him, male and female, he created them, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, fill the land, fill the earth and subdue, the word subdue is conquer and command. That's what God intended for the man, have dominion, have authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. <clears throat> so in Genesis chapter 20, sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, we see a relationship between God, between man and land. Can you see it there? God created man in his own image and likeness. God then created the man, and then he created also, man to have dominion over the creation. Now, this is what God said concerning the land. See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food as it, as it was so. That means the land that God created was meant to be a blessing to man. Every tree would be fruitful. Everything that God created was to be a blessing for man. In Genesis 2, verse 15, the Bible says, when God created the man, only the man, not the woman, created the man, gave him dominion over all the earth and what he created. In verse 15, he says, then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Now, God didn't tell man, I've created you, go have a field day and find wherever you want to live. He didn't say that. God had a specific place in mind, and he had a specific assignment for the man. And then he took him from where he created him, put him in Eden, a place, a specific place, and says, now tend and keep it, a specific work or an assignment for the man. For the man. It's the responsibility that God gave to the man tied man into a very unique relationship between God and the land. That responsibility brought a relationship between both God and land. And that responsibility also came with one command 
that God asked Adam to keep. And God said, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, no restrictions. You can eat of any tree. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you will surely die. And I'm talking about spiritual death, which ultimately leads to physical death. Now, there are two fundamental responsibilities that God gave the man. And this is important for us. The first one is the responsibility of being obedient to God. What's the first one? Being obedient to God is our responsibility, not our choice. The first responsibility is being obedient to God. And the second responsibility is fulfilling his assignment. Fulfilling his work that he has assigned for every individual. That's what God gave to man right in the beginning. He got work. He got his assignment. What was his assignment? To tend, to keep, to cultivate, and to protect the land. It was only after that, after the, God gave man these two responsibilities, God thought of bringing him a suitable partner. So men, do you get the message? We think of wife and then we think of responsibility. But God created the man first, put him in a specific place, gave him a specific assignment. And when God thought man fully understood that with no distractions, God says, now I think you're ready for a partner, suitable partner. The animals were not suitable, so he had to make one. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. He was known as the man. <laughs> Today we use the phrase, the man. So that's what God called the man. It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a, a helper suitable for him. So now in verse 19 and to 21, you will see for the first time, God gives the man a name. What's his name? Great. There the child knows it. Good one. I like it when children are in the service and they're more attentive than some of us. Some of us, full stop. In Genesis 2.21, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs, just one, and closed up his flesh, probably the first operation that ever happened. Took it out and closed it up perfectly well. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. So the man was made out of dust. The woman was made out of refined dust. Came from the rib. <laughs> Taken from his side. Not from his feet, from his side. When Adam saw her, he said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, just a side remark, it was God who named the man. It was the man that named the woman. And you know, till today that's true. Once you get married, you become Mr. and Mrs. and the husband's name. Isn't it true? Now the world wants to change it. No, you're an independent. All those independents, God has a message for you. If you've not learned it, you will get married. In verse 24, God has his first message to the married couple. Who's the married couple? Adam and the woman. He called her woman. We'll go slowly. The woman. And God said to them in Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And Adam was totally confused. Who are you talking about? Well, I have no father and mother except you. But the reason why God said that, because God was laying a foundation for marriage. Remember, everything that began, began in Genesis 1 and 2. It was the beginning of family life. It was the beginning 
of foundation for how the world will govern, be governed. And God set up the creation and put man, giving man the instruction how to live and manage the world that he entrusted him with. Now, till Genesis chapter 3, the world was in perfect order. God, the creator, man, his creation, unique creation, given responsibility over the land. But from Genesis 3 onwards, we see the sad story that happens. Adam fails in his first responsibility. What's his first responsibility? His first responsibility is being obedient to God. What's our second responsibility? Fulfilling our assignment. That's our responsibility. And every one of us have an assignment. When Adam failed in his responsibility to obey God, it disrupted the relationship. And can I have the diagram? It disrupted the relationship between God and between man, man between land. Can you see the connection now? So we are tied in with the land. You have property, you will know that. And especially when it comes to dividing the property. Wow. God said to Adam in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and I have eaten from the tree from which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the, repeat, say it again, cursed is the, for whose sake? For your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And can you see man sweating from his brow to earn his bread? It was a result of man failing in his first responsibility that God gave to govern this world. And that responsibility is obedience to God. So when that is disconnected, there's a disconnect with our relationship with God. Everything falls apart and there's no perspective in what we do or even how we live. When Adam sinned, when Adam failed to walk in obedience to God, his work was affected. Now, why did God say that to Adam? Because he specifically told Adam, these are the two responsibilities I'm giving to you. Eve was not around. Adam should have been smart enough to tell his wife, look, that's not what God said. You need to listen and don't eat of that fruit. But Adam abdicated his responsibility. He failed. And God says, there's a curse on the ground. And for women, it's childbearing. It was only after Adam disobeyed or failed in his responsibility to, to obey God, he called the woman by her name, Eve. And it says there in Genesis 3.20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So on one hand, you see that the land is cursed because of man's disobedience or lack of responsibility towards God and yet on the other hand the opposite is true when man fulfills his responsibility of walking before God rightly the land can be healed so God has given us a way out he's given us an option and God makes this promise to his people in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, a very common promise or a verse that we use, but we fail to see the significance of it. Genesis, in 2 Chronicles it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Say this after me, turn from their wicked ways. So there are two instructions there. If my people humble themselves, pray and seek God, and then turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive what? I will forgive, say that loudly. Right there, God says, I will forgive their sin. And so our land needs healing. Your house needs healing. 
The land that you purchase need healing. And some of you live in homes where you're constantly disturbed. You have nightmares. You are struggling in your relationship. Suddenly job is lost. Suddenly sickness hits you. You do not know where it's coming from. Probably your land or your home is sick. Now don't call me to come and pray for your house. Can you shout amen? Oh, some good people <laughs> shouted amen. I'll tell you how to clean your own house. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, same chapter, verse 12. The Lord appears to Solomon. It's a continuing verse. God appears to Solomon by, Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen, say this after me, this place for myself. Place matters to God. Tell someone next to you, place matters to God. Where you stay matters to God. Which land you buy matters to God. And here is God saying to Solomon, if you keep the first covenant, pray, humble yourselves as people, walk in the responsibility of, of obeying me in, and my commands, I will hear your prayer, I will forgive your sin, and I will not just forgive sin, I will bring healing to the place you stay, I will heal your land. God not only establishes a covenant with us, but he also establishes a covenant with the land. Let me read verse 15 and 16, same chapter, 2 Chronicles. Now my eyes will be opened, my ears attentive to prayer that is made where? In this place. Now I know we are living in New Testament days and God doesn't live in, in houses built with hands. But there is something about place which is important to God. And we will see it in the New Testament. He says, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually on that piece of land. I will watch over it in every prayer that is said in that place. I will hear and I will fulfill. Look at the covenant that God makes between man and land. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 2. It says the Gentiles shall see your righteousness. <clears throat> that means those who don't believe will see your righteousness. The people's righteousness. And all kings your glory. You shall be called by your new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall, nor shall, shall your land any more be termed desolate. Listen to me. Have, have your attention. God is saying to the people, no longer would you be, be called forsaken, nor will your land be called desolate. And God gives them both a name. But you shall be called Epsibah. Who? The people shall be called Epsibah, and your land shall be called Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Can you say the word married? So you know what happens? There is a relationship between us and the land. You know, there's some relationship that old people understand. They never want to leave their house. It may be one bedroom, small house for them, my house. They have a relationship to that home. Now we name houses after grandfather. Soon as one grandfather's name is Thomas, all the names of the house will be Thomas. But God did it differently. He did it with a divine purpose. He established covenant between the man and the land. The literal meaning for Hepzibah means my delight is in her. That's the literal meaning for Hepzibah, my delight is in her. The meaning of the word Beulah means married. Relationship. Now listen to me. Something I'm going to say very important. I want you to note. Whenever God does something or says something, 
Whenever God does something or says something, he always has a particular place in mind before he does it. I like to throw in a suggestion here. When you're shifting house, don't look according to the budget of your house, which, when you, which way you can go. Ask the Lord to show you which house you need to go to, which land to buy. Because in that land and in that house is wrapped up something of God's assignment for you. Because there is something that God wants to say or something that God wants to do for you in your life. I wish I had more time to elaborate and share some of our stories about the homes that we shifted to, uh, to. Had a story. This building has a story. And if time permits, I'll share a bit of that story at the end of this message. When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verse 5, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. That means God is saying, I'm standing here. This place is holy ground. The rest is not. But on this place, it's holy. Show reverence. When God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and a place of bondage and slavery... He didn't just bring them out, not knowing where to take them. He had a particular place in mind before they could go there. And we see that in Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. We like that? To a land flowing with milk and honey. The land which you cho choose may not be a blessing to you, but the land that God takes you to will be a land which will bless you. And you will live in the blessing and in the goodness of the land. Flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, and you can read all the other ites that follow. In the Old Testament, God prophesied about a place where Jesus was born. Many, many years it was prophesied before it happened. And John, the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 42 says, Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? It was not by accident that he was born in a manger. It was by no accident that he was born in a small town called Bethlehem. God had a place in mind because God had an assignment for Jesus in that place and had something to say to him. Now, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but there are plenty of scriptures. Once you see it, you will see it all over in the Bible. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus had a specific place when he said to the disciples, go and prepare the Passover. Follow me as we read the, the, this, these verses together along with me. Not verbally, follow me. Luke chapter 22, verse 8 onwards. Here, it says that Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. That's an instruction Jesus is giving his two disciples. Go prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So look at how they replied. They didn't go out contacting an event manager. They didn't go out hunting for which will be the best suitable place. They kind of knew what it meant to hang around with Jesus. And they asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare? What did he say? What did they say? Where? What will you say when you want to shift? You don't even talk to God. That's another matter. You look at your financial statement. Are you with me? Are you okay? You enjoying this? You want me to stop? I knew you would say no. He says, where do you want us to prepare? Now in verse 10, Jesus doesn't give them address. 
He gives them direction. You know the simple thing here, take the address, go find it. After all, you know the territory. He doesn't give, he gives them direction. Look at the direction that, God, that Jesus gives them. Very interesting. He says, then you should, uh, behold, when you enter the, enter the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. So what you have got to do? Just walk into the city and just be alert. A man will come touch you and tell you he'll be carrying a, a, a pot of water. He will meet you. Follow him into the house where he enters. Don't ask him anything. Just follow him. Then you, will, you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? They have not met this guy. They have no clue who they followed. Whether it's the right guy who's carrying a pot of water. Just imagine if there were two others carrying a pot of water. They follow him. When they come to the house, they talk to the master of the house. This is the teacher and his disciples want to uh, um, eat the Passover with. Then he will show you, these are all the specifics, directions, not the address, the direction that Jesus is telling them. <laughs> Can you figure that in your mind, getting directions like that? Anyone wants to try it? I'll fix a place in Bangalore itself. And I'll tell you, you know, you just go <laughs> into Richmond town and you follow a man with a golden hat. <laughs> okay, let's not go there now. And then what will happen? He will show you a large... <laughs> Room furnished, that means it's well prepared. They go and make ready. Hmm. Welcome to Jesus' world. Don't miss 31st night. I got a very interesting message for you. We don't like God. You take me there. We must learn to follow directions. One direction will lead you to the next. In verse 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 13, so they went and found it just as Jesus said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Look at me. Jesus had a place in mind for a specific assignment, for a specific message. Can you see that? Why can't he use any place? Disciples, go find a nice big room. Go find a place that's furnished enough. Make sure the AC is working. And then uh, we'll prepare the Passover and give me a call and I will come. Sorry, doesn't work that way. And we must learn something from the, from the disciples. When God tells you to move, don't get up and move. Say, where you want me to move? Did you know that I never wanted to establish church in Cockstone? Never. I said, my family is here, her family is here, friends are here. This is like one Bible belt and there's so many churches. I don't want to be one among them. I want to go far away. And I went to Indranagar. I went to Fustin, that uh, near Commercial Street, Dickinson Road. Then we moved to Indranagar. From Indranagar, I was looking something further away. Then we went to Rotary Club. And then riding to uh, Lottery Club, that's on Laville Road, having a service, service hall was getting smaller, trying to find a bigger place. Riding on my bike, the Lord speaks to me and says, I want you to shift. I said, shift? Where, Lord? Cockstone. You know, God has a funny way of telling you to do something that you never like. So get used to it. If you're upset and fighting with God, you never gave me what I want, that's how it will always work for you. Because our flesh has one will, the spirit has another will. 
And not necessarily everything that goes through your mind is, is of God. Because we tend to look at things from our comfort and convenience. But God looks at it from the, from the point of assignment and what he wants to do. So as I'm writing, I'm talking to the Lord and said, God, give me a sign. If you want to, me to us to move the church into Coxton, show me the place. Show me. I don't know where to go. Show me. I come here to this place, and this was Anne's grandmother's property, or grandfather's property, whatever. Sounds your grandfather's property, it sounds like that, so, okay. This was here. And both of us came, we were married at that time. Her uncle from Bombay happened to come down, and he said, son, I wanted to show you something. I said, what? He says, come with me. So I follow him. There was a step, and there was this, just an open terrace. And he says, uh, my parents always wanted a Christian meeting, a church, or anything that you feel in your heart you want to establish. This terrace is free. I will not charge you anything. Put up a building, and you can use it for your church. And I'm thinking to, to myself, I just had a conversation on the road with God. Before I could come here, and God has already stationed a man to tell me where, to, where the place is. And we took this place up. We raised the money. So that was, that's another miracle. We put this place up with tin sheets. Congregation people came, uh, cured the waters, threw water on the walls to, for curing. We were so involved because we tried to save every penny to see this building up. This was not, it wasn't as big and as wonderful it is, as it is now. There was an outhouse. And then to cut the story short, God puts it in my heart and he says, you will move into that house. I said, that house? And I moved into that house and I still never forget. Mari's husband, Duncan, he was one of the trustees. He came and he saw the house with rats running, a uh, load of asbestos sheet, you know, with, covered with false roofing. And he says, it's a disgrace for us to tell people our pastor is staying here. He says, forget about you. We'll feel embarrassed. You know what I told him? He said, when God gives us this property, we will not have a problem with getting people. He laughed at me. He says, we just barely have one lakh on an offering or something. You're thinking of buying a property. I just said it out of my spirit. Today, we're living in a fulfilled promise. Surely as the Lord lives, this is what God has brought us into. Do you know the living miracle that we have here? We have no bow well. We feed a hundred and odd students plus and more staff people, Adna and uh, the reach staff. We have people coming in and out of this place. People from outside come and take drinking water. We never lack water. Never like water. And think, how do we do? We don't have a bow well. I didn't go looking for parking place. The guy came and says, you know, we want, you want the land for use for parking. People were parking on the roads. We finally signed an agreement, 15000 for that parking place. God had an assignment. And he had something to say for all of us. Let's look at another incident. The resurrection of Jesus. After the resurrection of Jesus, Mary Magdalene sees Jesus at the tomb and he instructs her, go tell the disciples in Matthew 28, 10, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, specific place, Galilee, and there they shall see me. I had a place in mind. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Lord, can't you speak to me here? No, you go to that mountain and speak to you there. Get used to New Testament living. New Testament living is not God coming at your beck and call when you want to do things and when you don't want to do things. He's a God of specifics. And that's why when he gave the tabernacle, he gave specifics to the detail. 
You think he's not interested in where we live? You think he's not interested in what we do, where we go? He is very much involved in it. But unless we position ourselves to the place, we will never fulfill his assignment, neither will we live in the blessing of what God intended for us. And it says they went to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but though some doubted. And then Jesus, the place, and then he has an assignment. And then he gives them their work. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You get to the place, you get closer to the assignment. You get to the assignment, you live in the good and the fulfillment of your destiny. What about the promise of the Holy Spirit? I've taken significant events of God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For, Ju for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now look at the place and the assignment or the purpose that is tied up together. In Acts 17 verse 26. There was a place in Jerusalem and there was a purpose in Jerusalem. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 17 26 God said and he referring to God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell all the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed time. There is none in this world who is living in a time such as this. You were pre-appointed to live in this generation and in this time. And this is what God's saying. You were determined they were determined their pre-appointed times and doesn't stop there. And their boundaries for their dwellings. You are no, by no means an accident born in this nation. Whether you like it or not, we were destined to be in this nation for a purpose. That's what the word boundaries is. Talking about the place where we live. The place where Jesus will return is already prophesied before it can ever happen. God had a place in mind, even for the return of Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched on Mount Olives, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, talking about his disciples, Bids them farewell. In front of their own eyes, he sees, they see Jesus ascending up. And then behold, two men, two angels stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven looking at Jesus ascend? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. One of the joys I had last year, year before last, stood on Mount Olives and I said, the very place destined for the return of the, of the Messiah, the return of Jesus. Do you know what's happening there? People who are Muslims or uh, the Arabs are all building their graves on the on your olives. Why? Because they want to be first resurrected. Even there, they're looking at it carnally, thinking if you're close to the place, you'll be resurrected first. It's only those who are dead in Christ will be raised first. Okay, that's it. Are you seeing something new this morning? Start going by your spirit rather than your mind. Look at this place was even prophesied by Zechariah. I will close at this one uh, scripture. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4. And in that day, speaking of Jesus' return, 
His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to the west. So it's talking in that day when he returns. So not only Zechariah prophesied about a place, from Bethlehem prophesied about a place, years, decades old, prophesied. If everything came to pass, be for sure, it will come to pass, he will return the same way he went on Mount Olives, and the world will see him. I want us to get ready, church. If and when we move, we will all be there. It's so easy. If I, it was left to me to make a choice, I would have made a choice long ago. I would have got, got in touch with the real estate and said, give me the cheapest property out of, out of the city. Let me see what, how big a property I can build. Well, I've learned something. I've been trained differently. And I've been trained, just go by that one voice. The God who led us here will be the God that will lead us in the future. And I want you to, us to be prepared. And this 31st night, we will be taking a faith offering. And that's what the Lord put on my heart. For the future, what God is going to do. We live in the anticipation and you will soon hear good news. Can you hear shout an amen? amen? Are you blessed this morning? So I trust that we will make spiritual decisions. How do you sanctify your home? We have clean our home in this season. It's nice and tidy, decorated, painted. We get out all the clutter. Do the same thing for, your, uh, for spiritual cleaning. Only thing, you get out the clutter from your life. Three things that, Jesus, the, that the Bible says, if my people humble themselves, come back to God. Come back to God. And says, so God, we have strayed away, whether it's in your marriage relationship, whether it's in your relationship with God, whether it's in your relationship with the church or with other people, say, God, I've gone far away. I have made relationships a bigger priority than you. If it's your work, come back to God and say, God, I placed my work bigger than you. Humble yourself before God. And say, God, even if I'm in that place of work, it's because of your grace and I'm coming to you. Humble yourself before God. There is nothing to be proud of. If you have not realized that, sooner or later, the good way or the hard way, you will realize it. There's nothing actually. Everything about our life is nothing but a display of His grace. Nothing. And the second thing, turn from your wicked ways. You know, a couple told me, come, you know, cast out the spirit of anger, we're all fighting. And I thought to myself, if I cast out the spirit of anger from the house, and if they start fighting, the anger will come back twice. The answer is not casting out the spirit of anger. The answer is stop getting angry and start loving one another. When you turn from your wicked ways, God will forgive your sin. And then, say it again loudly, God will so if your sin is a moral immorality, if you are a single person and being immoral in that place, repent, seek God's face, ask, uh, turn from your wickedness, God will forgive you of what you have done. However you defiled your place, God will forgive you for that wickedness. And God gives us the assurance, He will forgive you. And that's the covenant that God has made with us today. He will forgive us. And he will also heal the land and say, God, we have defiled this place. We have made our home and a place of torment. We have made a place, made it an atmosphere of unpleasantness. We can't even talk to one another. There's so much of hostility. God, would you forgive us, Lord? We have not sinned against one another. We have sinned against you. And that's what the prodigal son said. Father, we have, we are, I have sinned against you. He didn't say, I've sinned against my father. I've sinned against you. And that's the beginning of repentance, knowing that we sinned against God before we've sinned against people. And we've sinned against you. Repent and turn from your wicked ways. He will not only forgive you, he will heal your house. Do you know that you create the atmosphere of your own home? 
If you speak words of uh, love and kindness, if you, you just learn to rejoice and be happy at home, you're creating an environment in your home. But if you have a grumpy face, your husband sees you, the wife sees you, they look at you, hey, uh, I'd rather pray, looking at you looks depressive. You know, there's no peace. There's always something nagging, something grumbling about. You, if you don't have something to grumble, you'll find something to grumble about. And blame the other partner, you, you only. Stop it. Get back to God. Humble yourself before God. You being a husband is not, and having the respect you need is not your right, That's your resp- but it's your responsibility to be a husband. Wives, it's not your right to demand anything from your husband. It's your responsibility to be a godly ma- woman. And if you could only live with your first responsibility towards God, being obedient to God, there will be very little marriage problems and very hardly any divorces taking place. The places where we have gone wrong is not in our relationship with one another. We have gone drastically wrong with our responsibility towards God. Someone for God shout shout amen. Amen. You know, it's true. If you want to heal a relationship, start with your relationship with God. If you want your land or your home to be healed, start with your relationship with God. Because that's how the unique relationships that God has designed between God, man, and the land. We are intertied with one another. And we are the focus point of whether the land will be blessed or the land will be cursed. Abraham failed in his first responsibility, brought the land under a curse. And it continues actually. Like I said, no time. Come for the prime ministry training. You'll learn more. But you know what? God has given us a way out. We, not, we, not be, we will not be able to heal the whole nation. But we can start with our home. We can start with our home. You know, Mikey stayed in our home. How many weeks he stayed? Okay. Not one week, two, one month. Okay, one month he stayed. And I thought, you know, how many? Six months, six months he stayed, huh? Okay, so okay, whatever, he stayed. And so I thought, you no, know, being in a home, he would have learned something very profound in the way we live. And I, I asked him the question. I said, what did you learn in our home? You've been with us, you watched us, we've spoken. He says, I've learned one thing. Your house is very peaceful. I said, that's all? But you know what? Peace is the presence of God. And we shall live with that peace every, every day of our lives. Peace on the inside. Peace with God. Peace with one another. If we live in that place of peace, we'll come back to the Garden of Eden. We'll start living in that atmosphere that God intended for you and me. Shall we all stand, please? Father, I just thank you for each one that is here this morning. And I pray for everyone that hears this word, Lord. God, listening to this message live. People who will download and listen to this message. I pray for each one that we will take a hold of this truth, Lord. And we will stop living in defiled homes and defiled places. But God, that we will be instruments that you've chosen for a particular place and a particular assignment. And that we will not compromise by our our reasoning, but we will seek you like the disciples. Lord, where do you want us to go? And Lord, I pray that we will embrace the reality that we could live in our healed and wholesome atmosphere where there is healing, where there is freedom, where there is peace in our homes as we humble ourselves before you. And I pray that the end of this year, we will get right with you, Lord. We will set our priorities right. We will set our motives right, Lord. I pray, God, for every single one, Lord, that, God, we will read, never fail our first responsibility that you've given to the man. And our responsibility Responsibility is walking in the light, walking in obedience to you, so that we 
not only receive forgiveness of sins when we turn away from our, those ways, Lord, turn away from those, uh, those ways that have drawn us away from you, you will not only forgive us, but you'll bring healing to their homes. You will bring peace to their homes. You will bring prosperity to their homes. They will live in an atmosphere, oh God, where people will walk in and say, God is in this place. I pray, Lord, that we will be not only the living, walking temples of yours, but our homes will be your dwelling place. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.